designs for the 21st century. Some of them may not be realized until then. Others are becoming familiar landmarks around the world. The radomes on the dew line, the Kaiser Dome in Honolulu, Hawaii, the American Society of Metals building in Cleveland, the Union Tank Car Roundhouse in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the United States Information Agency exhibition in Tokyo. These geodesic domes are some of the tangible signs of a way of life and of living formulated by the comprehensive anticipatory design scientist R. Buckminster Fuller. He anticipates both materials which improving technology will develop and needs which will require new solutions. He thinks in the future tense, and for Fuller, the future comes fast. His Dymaxion houses were labeled fantastic in 1927. Today, his domes stretch around the world. They are found as vast auditoriums, banks, restaurants, private homes. His basic concern has always been to make available the total resources of the world to mankind. To understand the needs of world man, he has devoted much study to the animal man and his ecology, the science which deals with the relationship of any given species to his environment. The man eco ecological pattern was predicated very much as with the wolf on his ability to move about with his legs. We we'll recognize that the human being has a very different ecological pattern from that of a tree. A tree has roots and cannot move around. The tree regenerates by developing its flowers, fruit, and seed. And then the seed is designed as a little aeronautical device to, go, to be, get into the wind and to be distributed on by the wind. Inasmuch as there are prevailing winds around the earth, it's very interesting, we have pine tree belts and palm tree belts that go right around the earth. So that the, it is true then that the, that kind of life as tree does travel, but travels only from generation to generation by blowing around the earth. Man, along with the birds and the fish and other animals has ability to move within its own generation, which is a very different kind of a growth. And it has then the ability to advance and retreat. And really trying to understand about man and how to serve man, we have to really understand then this, this basic fact that he does have the fact ability to move. Very often men have felt themselves to be such a small part of so great an earth They've felt that they did not move around very much. Therefore, they have really tended to liken themselves more to a tree than to the, than the wolf. And they've thought about putting down roots, they say, and this family stays pretty much in the same place. But the fact is that their real survival capability has, was built into their ability to move, to advance and retreat, to, to run away and fight another day. Discover then that man on his feet can only move a very, relatively very short distance, even though he has fairly long legs. The armies of prominent countries around the earth, Swiss Army, English Army, German Army, United States Army, French Army, have measured the distances that people walk. They put pedometers, not only on soldiers, but they put, uh, had test cases of pedometers put on train nurses, on housewives, and on the butcher, and, and the postman, and train nurse, and so forth. It has been found that humanity walks an average of 1,300 miles a year. Because there's some people in invalids don't move around, and there are other people that are going to be covering 1,700 miles, but average is 1,300. Probably has been that for all ages of man. Now, up to the time of World War I, man was pr moving around primarily on his feet aided mildly by horses. Not too many men had horses, and so that they, they, the people who had horses covered a little more distance, but not prominently greater. The majority uh, didn't change the, the average of man. And the world began to mobilize, so that by 1919 in America, 
we were riding in some vehicle or another, other, getting around from here to there other than by our feet, a distance of 1,600 miles a year. We were still walking the 1,300. We sat in the car seat instead of in the, the front parlor seat, and instead of getting up and walking into the kitchen, we got up and walked in the drugstore out of the automobile. The automobile really became a little mobile section of our, our front porch got glazed in and put wheels on it and rolled down the street. So men went over the horizon. So we were then walking 1,300, riding 1,600, a total of 2,900 miles a year. Since that time, this mobilization of total man has been increasing very, very rapidly, not just in America, but all around the world. As we went into World War II in America, we were moving a distance of 4,500 miles a year. The average salesman was riding 30,000 a year. The average housewife, 10,000. The average air hostess, 100,000. We used to say up to World War I that the people who went out of town were the irresponsible ones. They, they were gypsies. Suddenly, we, our whole world had changed. We're at the point where Einstein is right instead of Newton, and change is beginning to be normal. Motion was an, an omni motion universe. It begins to be normal to man's way of thinking and feeling. He discovers an extraordinary value, not only of his legs, but of his intellect to perceive the principles of, of locomotion and to be able to externalize those motions into these ecological tools by which of which man then began to alter his whole environment. At the present moment, average man uh, in America is going 10,000 miles a year. A man of my age, I, I, have fl I have gone by land vehicles a million and a half miles in my lifetime, and I've flown a million and a quarter miles. Now, I'm fairly typical of, of, the, of the new sweep out of this post-World War I man. So for the first time in the history of any living species, the living species began to alter its relationship to its environment very, very rapidly. The bird didn't change it. They did have the tools all right, but it didn't change its ecological pattern. Humanity was the first to ever change its ecological patterning. We're at a point now where we are covering so much distance that, for instance, in the United States, of the United States citizenry, there are now outside of the United States more citizens all the time traveling around the world than there were citizens in the United States at the time that we became the United States. The patterning is towards becoming a total world man. And we see then the mobilization bringing about some very strange new results, as for instance, the new factory can be a great distance away, and so people move great distances for their jobs. The census of 1950 showed that every year, 20% of America moved out of town. When I was a young, young man, we had moving day twice a year in the spring and the fall, at which time the sort of econo economic balance that people hadn't done very well moved into poorer quarters and people who moved into, uh, had more money moved into better quarters. There were sort of musical chairs all in town. But suddenly, we discovered that people were moving out of town. If people were moving out of town 20% every year, meant that every five years, America moved out of town. And if there are any people who don't move out of town and say, I don't think that's really the, the pattern, that, that I can then point out that, that, I, that I'm the typical uh, balance to them, and I keep up the average because I move out of town every week. And so that man is really mobilizing that way. The last census, 1960, preliminary figures coming in show that man is moving out of, America is moving out of town every three years. Now this gets to be very significant in as much as we have, for instance, national elections every four years. While we're moving out of town every five years, you about had time to get in place in the musical chairs before the next vote came along, you could vote. But even the last election, over 10 million of the uh, potentially voting electorate could not vote because they just hadn't been in town long enough to qualify. With the next election, very much less number will be able to vote. And with the velocity which we are apparently moving out of town and becoming world men, very soon we will not be able to carry on a national election on a geographical basis. We'll have to, we have, to have some new kind of a fundamental base, possibly it'll be an occupational base. And then say then that man is, with the industrial equation, vastly altering his ecological patterning so, so rapidly that the earth, as, as we all know, shrunk. I have a good picture of that. If we 
have a, a, a sphere which is 20 feet in diameter. I'm going to use that as my basic model, and that would represent the rate at which man could get around the world if he had to walk around the world, and I had a pathway for him to walk the 25,000 miles around the world. We give him a horse, and it shrinks from a 20-foot ball down to a ball about six feet in diameter. We give him the clipper ship, and the, and the earth began to shrink some more. The railway and the steamship shrunk the earth down to about the size of a baseball. Then we give him the airplane, and, the, and it shrinks down to a golf ball, and with the latest jets, down to about the size of a pea. These are the, the actual ratios of, of shrinkage. And that's, that approximately occurred during my living time. Uh, uh, this is then the first time in the history of any known living species where a living species has altered this relationship to the universe. We have this idea of, of our being in a very extraordinary new kind of an acceleration. With the new uh, ships about to come up, these supersonic transport ships, which we will have within another five years, we'll be able to get up after breakfast, reach any point on the earth, do our day's work, and be home for dinner. So we'll be realistically in a one-town world. I see, then, a very extraordinary challenge to humanity to, in, in the development of the capability to be really very comprehensive in dealing with, the, with his total potentials. I find that these trends and of the industrial tools are towards making the problems that were seemingly very important and yet local no longer the important problems. Because as I fly around the earth, and I find myself flying around the earth very, very frequently now, I find that the, the people did look a little differently. Certainly the most extraordinary, interesting kinds of buildings they had and boats that were different from the ones we had. But I find that they're beginning to use the same, the airports are going to be all the same, and they begin to fly the same kind of airplanes. And there is, is a new kind of relationship of man coming to the whole earth. I'm quite confident that, that this is not going to eliminate the interestingness of the, of, the, the, uh, of the earth, because I'm quite sure that man is going to have more and more realization of this, and he's going to do more and more about preserving the, the, uh, uh, the, the very interesting, typical kinds of old ecology. And he will uncover thousands of years earlier archaeology, particularly as he goes below the surface of the sea, because man has so far in, inhabited only one quarter of the Earth's surface, which is the dry land. In fact, he only inhabits about a, a, a one quarter of one quarter. So he's in about one sixteenth of the Earth, the postage stamp area that he has had his ecological swing out in. He's now going, we know, skin diving and bath escaping and so forth, and atomic submarining into the depths of the water, water. So he's going to get to occupy that total ocean bottom. He's going to pull up the old ships he has to. He's going to understand a great deal more about the history of man. Life is going to get more, more interesting rather than less interesting. But very definitely, we're in a new kind of a challenge where we're dealing with the success of total man rather than the success of the local man. This interesting, challenging new world of the welfare of total man requires a new kind of understanding and approach to his problems. It comes from recognizing the unique qualities of the new era. I hear m many people say the scientists seem to be the only ones who are optimistic about our future. I don't think this is because the scientists have a, a unrealistic, but because the people who are saying it are saying what they're saying under very powerful conditioned reflexes. They're used to certain kinds of patterns. And the scientists are, are scientists because they are making measurements and discovering patterns which are not controlled necessarily by conditioned reflexes. Maybe the scientists that are looking, studying conditioned reflexes, but by and large, the scientists are beginning to discover certain factors regarding universe and, and factors regarding humanity that indicate, for instance, that the, uh, the potential of man on Earth is really very high. And we recognize that most human beings are born with the uh, and 
very free, but they're told very early that uh, things are not quite so soft as they've been in the home, and it's the fact that they're going to be pretty tough when they get out in the world, that they're going to have to earn a living, and they're going to have to earn a living because, and they're going to have to hustle to, to get that job because there's not, there's, not, there's, not, there's not enough jobs to go around, there's not enough food to go around, there's not enough of anything to go around. The fact is, they right, right, right now, 40%, 44 percent of humanity are using all the metals that have been ever mined on the face of the earth. We're not finding more metals as fast as more people are, are being born. Therefore, seemingly, there is not enough to go around. But the fact is that whereas 44 percent of humanity are now enjoying the industrial equation, at the turn of the century, less than 1 percent of humanity are enjoying it. As we entered World War I, 4 percent of humanity were beginning to enjoy a higher standard of living. As we came into World War II, 20 percent. So now we're up to 44 percent. And this is despite the fact that the people are increasing more rapidly than we're finding more metals. So how are we having this higher and higher standard of living for more and more people? Because we're learning to do more with less. And this is the kind of thing that the man on the street doesn't realize the impact of. And the everyday man is conditioned to look at the fact that he's supposed to earn a living in this seemingly scarce world. But the scientist looks at that curve, the fact that the numbers are being served by the industrial equation is increasing very rapidly as we do more with less. And we, all he has to do is examine the total overall efficiency that is operative, the overall efficiency of the machinery. Operative in industry today is only about 4 percent efficient. That is the amount of work that is realized by the machine out of the energy that's put in is only about 4 percent. That's a very low percent. An automobile, which is a very poor piece of design today, is 15 percent efficient, theoretically. So it is, it is more than three times more efficient than the overall machinery being used by man. Therefore, to take care of all men instead of 44 percent of men would simply mean, say, three-folding the overall efficiency. And, uh, and that is coming. The, we know it's coming. I'll, just, I'll give you the gas turbine, which is, is 25 percent efficient. I'll give you some of the latest uh, kinds of the, the fuel cell. It gets up to around 80 percent efficiency. The new kinds of technology that are coming in are going to throw the efficiency so high that the scientist knows that we're going to be able to make the total resources of the Earth more than adequate to all men. I find that there's a great vanity of man that is developed in the conditioned reflexes because in conditioned reflexes men were very fearful and really didn't know their way around, yet they'd like to put up a strong front in order to try to have it you and the you or me to be sure that their family was in. So they tried to put up a front that where the, just the front alone was a tool that brought a lot to them. But I don't know any human being who can stand up before us and say, tell us really very much about himself. For instance, I don't know any human being who can stand, say, I am consciously pushing each of the million hairs out through the top of my head at certain preferred rates and shapes and colors. In fact, I don't know any man knows why he has hair, let alone to be able to tell me he's coordinating that. Uh, even though he knows his heart beats and his, he breathes and he knows that they, they are on some kind of a frequency, he doesn't have anything to do with the frequency and the coordination of his heart beating and his breathing. In fact, he does f fabulous numbers of things here in his head. Uh, 14, 14 quadrillion, uh, about a quadrillion times a quadrillion if you multiply that out, it would give you about the number of atoms that are in beautiful patterning interaction as our brain. We don't have anything to do with that. We don't know how that works at all. Most extraordinary p computer. Men don't know why they're successful at all. In fact, men are so vain and so local and so ignorant that they are the greatest obstacle to man's success. So I the the scientist happens to be a little edu better educated, a little freed of the condition reflex. Therefore, I'm not surprised that he sees things this way. Now, therefore, I'd say that it's quite clear that out of adversity, man has been very greatly advantaged. And I find that this is memorialized way, way back. Long ago, men used to drift on logs, making rafts with the tides and with the winds. After a while, they learned that they could do something very extraordinary, that they found that a, a, a raft, the minimum raft, could be made out of two logs. It would not tend to roll over the way one log rolls over. Connecting two logs, it wouldn't roll over, and that was raft. If you had two, two logs parallel to one another, you'll find that the 
the frontal area of the two logs, as you look at them from their ends, have very little resistance. But looked at sideways, have very great resistance. Therefore, when the wind blew against the raft, the raft tended to drift in the direction of the, uh, of the logs were pointing, rather than directly to, to leeward. Men learned gradually then that with the wind blowing their, uh, hard on their raft, and it was not going downwind, but going sideways, that they'd had it a momentum. Therefore, they could stick a, another flattened piece of wood down in between the two logs, and they could steer it, and they could make it literally go up into the wind. This was a very extraordinary kind of realization. And with it came the ability to develop the into the wind sailing. So they began to make sails that, which caught more wind and drove it faster. And this, this is the way, for instance, a, an ice boat today, which slips along the ice very beautifully, but in absolute grooves as those logs tried to be in the water. But the ice, sh sh ice skates are very much sharper, the ice boat. And, and in the 30 mile an hour wind, we'll get up to 60 mile an hour speed out of this angular relationship of drive. Men then learned that they could literally sail into the wind. Therefore, the adversity, which was the wind which seemed to be blowing against them, turned to be, a, 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 if you can use your head and learn how to use angles and so forth, you could literally beat to wind it. And that's what they learned to do. And long ago, fishermen learned to do that in the South Seas. And we find in Japan, great island people are sea people. There is a, there's a children's day today, and children's day in Japan is characterized by the most beautiful decoration on all the houses, and they're great long fish streamers. They are fish kites. The air can, the wind can get into the no, mouth of the fish and fill the belly of it, and so the beautiful fish is streaming off of the house. They have one of these fishes up for each of the boys in the family. And the reason it's a fish is that it symbolizes the salmon and it symbolizes the salmon because the salmon swims up the river and then up the waterfall to spawn. That is, he goes against the stream to profit and to regenerate. So that really the symbol, the hope of the Japanese is that their boys will turn adversity to advantage. Turning adversity to advantage and turning it in tools, I've, into tools, I'd like to think a little more about tools themselves. And I found that it's very interesting to realize we have no tools that are not some, uh, that, that are not ex uh, extroversions of internal or organic functions of the human being. As for instance, the human being no sooner is born than he begins to discover he's thirsty. Nobody has to tell him to be thirsty, he just discovers he's thirsty and if they, and when he gets large enough to get around on his feet, old enough to get around on his feet, he'll find water if he can when he's thirsty. And he discovers pretty soon that you don't find water every time you want it. But when he does find water, he finds that he can inhibit that water by, he, he watches a cat and a dog and they lap it up. And I, I watched lots of children trying to lap up water. <laughs> but they find it is easier to cup their hands and get out the water. They can handle more in their hands. So they will tend to do that. And they discover then that they don't have water when they want it. They can cup it with their hands when they do find it. They might say when they do find quite a lot of very good water, they might say, why don't I hold it some more in my cupped hands until I'm going to be thirsty again? Well, they discover they don't have their hands available to do other extraordinary tasks that their hand is adopted to do to give them an extension of the stick. So what they did was to invent a, an imitation cup, an imitation cupped hands. And that is the beginning of our pottery vessel. In fact, the basketry, which they used first, and tarred it and so forth. They, they made a vessel. And the vessel, it, the, the concave container, is really one of the most fundamental, the earliest of all of our inventions. There, there we can really see that what happened was he left his hands behind by the well <laughs> to have extra hands ready. Then he made hands that could handle hotter liquids than his bare hands could handle. Every way we can see the tool being extended. In fact, we discover all of our tools have been developed from our recognition of repeated functions that were integral functions when we suddenly said, why do I stand over here to do this every time when I can invent this thing which will do it when I'm away from it? So that the whole development of, of, of automation is the direct consequence of intellect's perception of the repeated patterns and realization that it can externalize those patterns. And what man did to, in order to be able to externalize them then was to organize the environment in the following way. The environment was essentially energy, as the Einsteinians have well shown us. 
They have energy as matter. Energy as matter represents all the patterns of energy, dynamic, inter inter interfering with itself, where every time it interferes with itself like this, it gets bounced like that, and it gets to here, and it runs into itself again, and it gets bound bounced around into knots. Every time it runs into itself, it con tends to contract more and more. It is locally regenerative. That's what we call energy as matter. What we're going to discover is that the energy as matter cannot wear out because the physicists have discovered that they could, it was safe to say, experimentally, that energy could neither be created nor lost. Energy may leave this, this particular local machine entropically as heat, but it can only leave this one by, by virtue of joining up with another system. It does not go out of the universe. Energy cannot be created nor lost, therefore the, what we call wealth, which is organized capability to deal with the physical environment, is essentially made out of that energy which cannot wear out. Then we have the other kind of energy as radiation, and that does not wear out. We have one other factor in our wealth, which is intellect. And every time intellect makes an experiment of associating the, en the energy as matter in various new patterns of, of leverage, and makes an experiment of shunting the energies onto the ends of the levers to make it do work, we learn more. Intellect cannot learn less. It always learns more. This is the quality of experience. Therefore, learning more, we organize the energies m more effectively, the efficiencies go up, and the wealth is increased, the capability improves. Therefore, the wealth of man is, is irreversible. It cannot get to be less, it can only get to be more. The Fuller World is produced for national educational television by WGBH-TV, Boston. This is NET, National Educational Television.